Showman Thomas Hiskell heads to the Trist, like his ancestors who made the annual autumn trip to Larbert in Stirlingshire. At one time the fair came by train, and the heavy equipment was unloaded at a local coal siding. Sometimes a ride, like the old-fashioned steam yachts, would be packed in anything up to five trucks, the showman's name for road trailers, and these would be hitched to a traction engine and hauled to the Trist ground. Before the motorways, Larbert was the crew junction of Scotland, with the lines from the north meeting those from the east and the west. The cannons in the local shopping centre are a reminder of the guns built at nearby Carron Ironworks for Nelson's Navy. It was here that Roebuck and Watt acted as midwives to the birth of the Industrial Revolution in Scotland. The foundries are still working, although not as many as they used to be, but they're turning out high-quality castings for a number of industries. Today, the production lines are computer-controlled, and gone are the times when a casting was left to the skill of individual foundrymen. In a delightful 18th-century traditional farmsteading on the outskirts of the village, Barbara Davidson works her magic with clay. It's very enjoyable to sit here at the wheel and see the clay after it's been thrown onto the, onto the wheel head mixed with some water, working its way with the help of some craftsmanship, a bit of skill and a lot of magic into a pot. Pots can take all sorts of shapes and that's really what the fun is. It's having total control over the clay and making anything you want. And none of these pots will be left on the shelf for very long. The village is also home to McCowans, the manufacturers of Highland Toffee. Miles and miles of different ranges of confectionery are produced every day. My name is Hugh Brown. I'm commercial director with McCowans Limited. The company was founded by Andrew McCowan, who came as a cattle driver to the Trist Fair. He then commenced selling confectionery from a barrel in the local area and ultimately moved into manufacturing using milk from the cattle which he brought to the fair. And anyone who's ever waited for their winning football scoreline to come up knows that this is also the home of the Warriors, Stenhouse Muir football team. <laughs> Next to Oakle View and wedged in behind houses, the golf course and the cricket club is all that remains of the traditional triced ground. It once covered up to 75 acres, as Falkirk District Museum's curator Jack Sanderson explains. Before the railways and the canals were invented, the only method of getting your cattle to market was by road. Scotland was crisscrossed by many drove roads, which found their way eventually down to the central belt of Scotland. Initially, the first cattle markets were held at Creef, but latterly they were held at Falkirk, firstly at uh, Reading Muir Head, near Falkirk, then at Rough Castle, and finally at Stenhouse Muir. The cattle drovers themselves often came from considerable distances, up to 150 miles away, and as they could only move at 10 to 12 miles a day, it would obviously take them some time to arrive. 
By 1785, the Stenhouse Muir site had been established as the site for the main cattle markets, and it remained so until the last years of the 19th century. The trice was held three times a year, the October trice being the largest, with up to 30,000 cattle being sold. By the end of the 19th century, the cattle trice were beginning to decline. The reason for that was twofold. First of all, the cattle produced by the new agricultural revolution could not walk quite so far as the original hardy beasts could. And secondly, the arrival of railways into central Scotland by the 1840s meant that a network spread northwards, allowing English buyers to travel by train to the site to buy their cattle and take their cattle back south by the same method. By the mid-19th century, the tries had become well established and began to attract all sorts of travelling people and entertainers. A report in 1849 quotes that there was assembled a mixed multitude of cattle dealers, fishers, drovers, auctioneers, peddlers, jugglers, gamblers, itinerant fruit merchants, ballad singers and even beggars. My first recollection of folk of Christ, of course, was a very small boy being taken over and I was only interested, of course, in the shows. But uh, I can remember horse scalpers, I think they called them, running horses up and down Trice Road yonder, uh, trying to sell horses to other people. My dad used to tell us about the cattle being in the Trice, and uh, he used to sell them, that's what they, they sold them at the Trice. And we used a wee dwarf that came with them, and he used to, uh, my, he used to come and stay with us at night, and lie in my sister's cradle. Is that small, wee Billy? I don't know what he did at the Trice, I don't really know. I remember when I was at school, my chum and I used to love going up the Trice. So we went to her garden and we got lots of flowers and we went up to the Trice to Madame Boswell's caravan and she had great big brass oven things outside her caravan and the flowers were put into them. And she was a swarthy type gypsy. I can remember my father taking me up to the Trist on a Sunday morning to watch the gypsies having breakfast outside their hooped caravans. And I can remember the sausages and the bacon sizzling. Back in the 60s, I stayed at Crowness Lawn, which was opposite the Trist Road, and I could see crowds and crowds of people coming off the buses to go to the Trist. Then there would be specials arriving about every 10, 15 minutes. Some would reverse and turn round at the end of the street. With an inspector there, he got the queues away on the specials back either Carnaway or Falkettway. And no sooner had it done that, there would be another queue forming for the next buses. Often this went on till late at night. Well, in the mid-1930s, there was this fire in the early part of the evening in the, in the fairground with the Trist. The van caught the fire. I don't know how, probably because of our lot or something burning in it. But uh, the van, as I, I can remember, was the old type, uh, uh, green circular vans with horse-drawn thing. But uh, the woman did eventually die, and as far as I can remember, but I wouldn't have swore it, I think she's buried in Stenishmuir Cemetery. I can remember when I was a very small girl being taken up the Trist on a Sunday morning. I can remember the very old gypsy ladies sitting, smoking clay pipes. And th there were two gypsy caravans, and they were like uh, the old covered wagon ones that you see in American movies. On the way on, there were stalls, and some of them sold plums and um, sugar hearts, sugar hearts. That was the one. The Trice was a, was a great, a great place to go to. I always loved when the trice came. Because we were really enjoying it in the trice, you know, the, the horses, the hard horses. And... I'll never forget, we held a trice Sunday on Owl Circus front. 
I think they called them the temperance. We all enjoyed the service and this used to fetch the organ and put it on the front of the circus platform. A man played it and there was a half a dozen and there was the choir and sung all the lovely hymns and preached. I can't remember many of the names, although there were names that you saw them every year. But the one name that sticks in my memory is Pinder. Every year Pinder went to the same spot in the trice in the circle where they went. And that was always the first place that the girl and I went to when we went to the trice was into the circus. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Pinder and I was born in Edinburgh in a caravan in Fountain Bridge in 1902. I was born in the circus. I was what they call a tight wire walker. I performed and danced on the tight rope. Well, the first time I remember the trice was uh, when I would be about 11 and I'd c come on a visit. And uh, I've seen all the roundabouts of that day. The was Evans was the lessee of the trice at the time and they had the big roundabouts and there was various coconut shies and there was a famous gypsy told the, the fortunes and all the people used to come and visit her. They called us Subi Boswell and there were cheriplanes as I remember. Somebody had the first set of cheriplanes and then of course there were sideshows. There was a midget and uh, different types of, of sideshows. One time they had the crown jewels here on display uh, in an exhibition. Well, I'm uh, George Robert Hanley, called after my father and my grandfather, who were showmen before me. There used to be maybe a couple of circuses. There's nothing new for two circuses to be opposition with one another. But years ago there used to be shows, sideshows, freaks, uh, Giants, midgets, uh, headless ladies, or uh, fat ladies, and different. Today, uh, I think they hide the freaks, or they don't come out like they used to do. I mean, years ago, show folk used to find out whether there was a, a, a midget and, and tell their people, like, we'll look after them and give them a, a nominal fee. And, and they used to sell postcards of themselves. And it was a it was a known thing for a midget or a pig faced lady or whatever. You know what I mean? People we got with business through people like that. Uh, and this is one of the places they used to come. There used to be a, a row of sideshows here at the Trice. But now there's only a, a few it's a dying trade. And as I say Nobody likes their children to be exhibited. But even although the showmen made their money out of the freaks, they also remembered the local handicapped children when they came to the Trist. Circus girl Elizabeth Pinder again. When we were all set for the matinee, we had a special matinee for Bell Stike's children and the, the nurses to look after them, put them all in line. And the circus was full. The high seats and the low seats and the children were on there. And they were still lighted. The showman's engine, like this one at the Nottingham Goose Fair, was the power behind the fair. Although they had to be constantly fed coal and topped up with water, they would make light work of hauling the heavy trailers, the showman's name for their caravans, and the trucks in which the rides and equipment was carried. And once the fair was set up, the engines would be used to drive the rides and produce the electricity for the bright lights. Dozens would be in operation at the Trist. Showman James Graham recalls the scene. The fair is different from what it used to be. It used to be jumping horses, fair girl, uh, condolas, steamboats, and uh, helter-skelters, you know. Well, the steamboats was a, it was an engine, and you had to fire the engine. Was it hard work? Well, it was hard work, especially if it was good weather, you sweat, because the boiler was right in front of your belly all the time, you know. 
he stood in between, behind the, both sides, and the fire was right, right, right on your belly, you know? And you had to fire that in between the time of the boat swinging. When the boat was swinging, then you fired the engine. The Graham family still have a set of gallopers, and when a local enthusiast sights his traction engine alongside, something of the old magic is rekindled. This is the Kokori Links market, but the scene could just as easily have been the triced. Well, two traction engines, and they used to pull three trailers each. One used to pull the jumpers, which was the centre, and two trucks for the horses. The horses used to park in one truck, and the platforms used to park on the other truck. And uh, the steamboats was a centre, a steam centre, pulled by the engine, and uh, two boat loads, with the boats sitting on the top of them, you know? And, uh, the, the caravans, sometimes we had to put the caravan at the back, which we made four trailers sometimes. But we only travelled about three to four miles an hour. The showmen still haul long loads. This is Joseph White Jr. arriving at the Trist after a 30 mile drive from Beath in Ayrshire. He's driving an Atkinson 8 wheeler, which is crammed full with equipment for the easy rider. Next comes a four-wheel centre truck, which houses the main drive and pay box, and around this vehicle, the rest of the ride will be built up. On the end is a staff trailer. It's a tight squeeze, manoeuvring wrong roads between the stalls. I'm Brian Gray, fairground enthusiast. Uh, an interesting thing about the fairground is the transport that's used, and it varies quite a bit in tight and age. Uh, for example, here is Walter Percival driving a 1965 ERF towing a four-wheel trailer caravan, which will be dating back 20 to 25 years old. It will have been in his family all this time, and uh, it's well made with the, the old boxes underneath where all the storage materials are kept. Well, when we arrive at Larbert on the fairground, all the caravans have to be set specifically in certain places. And this is where we all help one another, we have to. The caravans, uh, over the generations, there's modern and still old time ones, and smaller ones to suit different people for different sizes of families. Uh, the, the lessees of this fair are Rosemary and Jim Patterson. They've taken over a tradition that was handed down to their, their father, and they're actually living in a caravan that was their grandparents, which is uh, quite emotional to them. I'm Rosemary, this is Jim. They're joint lessees of the Trice Fair, which has been going on for a long time. After we get set up myself, the main job is to get everybody else organised, get the ground measured out so they can build the stalls up, and hopefully everything will go well for opening on things. Everybody has a, their own pitch within three or four feet of from year to year where they stand normally, but it still has to be set out by them. John Walter Cadona. I've travelled to the Trice from Irvine in the Magnum Centre. I come here every year. Been a showman all my life. I operate a giant octopus ride. It's very popular with the teenagers. Uh, it takes about Six hours to erect. Uh, works on an eccentric movement. 
goes round clockwise and it dips anti-clockwise. It uh, came from America originally. It's been in my possession the last 18, 20 years. Now, I'm just doing some repairs here. The shaft was worn on the key and the key was on the shaft. It's been removed, due to an engineer repaired, and I'm just fitting it back in. It controls the movement on the arms for the dip. Right, that's the finishing touches. <laughs> oh, well, okay. That's all set to go. Now, my name's Carl Pinder, and this is our attraction here, our ghost train ride, which we designed and built ourselves. It took six months to draw up the plans, and eventually myself and my two sons finished up with a ride that's unique. Um, this thing folds out, it loads itself on the ground, you take the wheels out, it loads itself hydraulically on the ground and the roof raises up, it all folds out and we have a really a nice attraction. But what makes this unique is the fact that we have a veranda, this type of hill and a car which travels much faster than normal ghost trains. Seating two to three persons with six cars. Well, this, as you can see, is some of the exterior decoration that we use on the front of the, the ride. Uh, they're nine feet high and uh, uh, about five, six feet wide. And uh, fiberglass moulds which I made up during the winter months, took me about a six week period to, to design and build them. And as you see, when the ride is fully erected and these are placed in their position uh, in sequence, they really make uh, a, a finishing touch to the, the piece of the My name's Yandy Koning. Uh, here you see my lorries coming into the Trice Fair from Paisley. Uh, I came up 250 mile from England last week to Paisley Street Fair. And uh, as you see here, we're coming into the Trice, which is a fortnight. I run the, uh, the Dodgem cars, uh, which is packed on a lorry and a trailer. I also have the other lorry which pulls my caravan. We have myself and either two or three people to put the ride up, uh, which takes us approximately a day. But the first job in the setting up of the dodgems is, is to lay the floor sections. Um, there's quite a lot of them. I couldn't really tell you how many. I've never counted them. Uh, just all the lads will be uh, will put them together, which they all know where they go because they've done it many times before and obviously every piece is numbered individually. We, the, the main thing is that it has to be perfectly level, perfectly level packed up solidly all the way around. Uh, the, the next stage is to, to set up the floor what the cars run on. There's, a, there's 76 pieces to that. It requires three men to carry each piece. It'll take us nearly an hour to put them all down. Uh, 
uh, straight after the floor comes the, the, the uprights which support uh, the roof and hold the main top structure up. The next stage is to then uh, erect the top, which we call the principles, the, the three main beams which all the rafters and everything else attached to. This holds the canvas roof up and the netting for the electric current to pass through. And there's no cranes involved or anything to do this, it's uh, purely elbow grease, manual labour. It's pretty hard work. Uh, you've got to get on the steps, only one of you, and lift it in with your shoulder, making sure all the time that the guy at the top is doing his part and guiding it into place all at the same time. Uh, we're always glad when the last one's in position and uh, you can have five minutes and sit back for a while. Uh, we have 16 cars on this ride. Um, they travel in the trailer which goes behind the main lorry. And obviously we have to be very careful when we're lowering these off the trailer. They're very expensive pieces of equipment. Uh, uh, you could probably buy a small, a cheap mini. Or even a dear money for the price of one of these dodging cars. The lights come next. Um, the ride's nearing completion now. We put the lights up, then we put the canvas cover up, then we wire it all up, which is a job no one likes. All the fiddly bits and uh, plugging in, and which takes quite a long while, really. One final check round now after we've wired up uh, and a couple of the mains on. Um, quick polish up with everything, make sure everything's clean, tidy, and then away we go open to the public. I'm only uh, a second generation showman on my father's side, uh, which isn't very long really in showman's terms. Uh, my name is Dutch, and that comes from my grandfather was Dutch. He came over here during the war. He wasn't a showman and he settled in London, New North Wales. My grandfather Simons, which on the other side, used to open at London Hall for the summer season where my mother met my father. They got married and he became a showman. I like the life because <laughs> I don't really know why because um, I've never really done anything else, so I don't really know anything else. Um, but I just couldn't see myself sitting behind a desk or pen pushing or anything. I don't like the hard working bit, but the bright lights and the music is nice. Hello, uh, my name's John Wilmot. Uh, I've come from Carlisle to be at this uh, fair at the Trist. Uh, this is the first time I think you've ever been here, our family, you know. The, my father might have been there 20, 30 years ago, but it's the first time I've been here. Uh, we used to travel with the galloping horses, only set in Scotland. But we found, you know, over the years that they, they wasn't paying us. Uh, so we decided to go into a new sort of venture. With this, uh, with the call of the Roundup, which is uh, very, very fast rough and ready for the, the teenagers and that's what people want uh, in this day and age we find uh, the faster it is and uh, the more exciting it is uh, they want to be on it so we're, we're, we're doing okay we're, we're getting by and if we can pay our bills and do that well it keeps everybody happy especially the bag manager you know And that's it. 
and when it's up in the air at night, uh, the light is good. Very nice, fantastic. Now, my name's Colin Sedgwick, and uh, we are just coming into Falkirk Trice for the Trice Fair. Now, the first week of the Trice, my son came in with a Super Bob, and then I have just arrived for the second week from Inverness Fair to build up the flying coaster. Now, the, the Super Bob ride, ride that we brought, we have, is an Italian machine. It's made by Sabima, and it's it takes about five and a half, six hours to erect. Now, after the, after the centre truck gets put in position, then we level off all the stretches and then the gates and gangways and uprights go in. Now, there are 24 uprights to the ride, which are stored away in the back of the lorry. Now what happens is the uprights get set in at the bottom and then I've got to be pushed up and slotted in. Now the next job that we do on this ride is the back scenery. Now the back scenery has to be all built up on the ground. It gets all erected and then it gets pulled up with tiffer jacks. It's uh, a very dodgy business because you've got to climb, climb about the framework as you're putting it up and you've got to watch you don't fall. Now the wires are getting connected to the tiffer blocks now, ready for pulling it up. Now we are now fastening the wires onto the pulleys, ready for it sliding up. Now once, once the three tiffer jacks are in place, they've all got to be worked together so as the whole lot goes up and doesn't jam. Now there's no framework added once the jacks are in place until the whole lot's all ready for moving up. Now the, the, the back scenery for the ride really takes an awful lot of putting up. It takes as much putting up as what the ride itself does. Now the next job is putting all the, the lighting up with the letters, which has got to be taken very much care of in case you break the bulbs. Now each letter can have 30, 40 bulbs in so we, we, you must not drop them. Now we are now putting the framework up for that takes the letters. Now give me an S, give me a U, give me a P. Now give me a B, now what does it spell? Super Bob. Now here come the boys now with all the, all the winter backdrop. We've actually got winter in Stenhouse Muir now. I mean the scenery makes the ride very attractive. Now, now all the scenery is coming together, it just looks like the Alps. Now the ride has 22 arms. On the end of each arm is a car. Now the arms are all, all on the centre truck and have to be lifted up, fastened onto the centre and onto the trams. Now at this point we're still about another hour and a half away from the ride being complete. Well that's all the arms are on now and it just looks like a spider's web. Now we are now ready for the cars. Now the cars are on the top deck of the lorry. Now to get them down we have a hoist that slings up and it rolls from one end of the lorry to the other with an electric jib and lowers them down onto the arms. Now this operation has got to be done very carefully otherwise you could bust the fiberglass cars. Now the cars are gently loaded into position and they're hooked on the back of the, the car in front and onto the arm at the back. Now after the cars are all in position, then they, they go around and they're all bolted down and pins put in. 
Now each car has a safety safety rope attached from one to the other. Now, now after the cars is all on and all bolted up, safety ropes put on, then the machine is all ready now for all being checked out, lights tried and the machine tried out. Now we are all ready now and all we need now is the public to come down and enjoy the ride on, on the fair. I come to the race because it's a tradition in my family. Well, my grandmother used to stay in the King's Street, which overlooks this area, and it's always been a thing that we would go to. It actually coincided with the start of this with her birthday anyway. I like it because of the It's one of these things, it's a it's happened through the years, I can't believe what a tradition is. Very enjoyable as well. What about you? You young again. Can you tell me why you keep your choice? Because I've got a six-year-old daughter that's been up in the plague my life for the past week to get down here. I like the entertainment and I like the bingo and everything. And especially if it's nice weather. Something for everyone, like testing your skill with a fishing rod on the bottle stall. Just get the bottle standing upright and you've won a prize. Whoops, well, it's not as easy as it looks. The bottle stall is one of a number run by the Percival family. So now you know what was loaded in the back of Walter's lorry, which had edged its way into the fairground a few days earlier. No luck? Well, there are plenty more attractions. Thomas Hisco's arcade purpose built to his own specifications is pulling the crowds. Like many of the fairground businesses, it's a family affair. His wife Frances sells hot dogs, toffee apples and of course candy floss. And their son Bennett operates the twist, one of the new style of thrill rides. But there's a different world behind the bright lights, as Thomas explains. Uh, a lot of people come and just see the, the bright lights of a fair, or they come down on the Saturday peak time. It looks like they're earning a fortune. And then there is a bit of money to be made in the business, but it's all made within a few hours. And unfortunately, this means our equipment has to be up to scratch. Uh, it's, it's a way of life what we do, but it is a business. We do have accountants, we have to pay our way for rents, we have to pay our own cleansing, dustmen coming down, gully cats for taking dirty water away, skips, advertising the local paper, and we all live. We all have to eat. It's like a village coming to some towns. And the shops, the pubs, etc. all got a good offshore off of this. But we don't just go haphazard. Our business is laid out a 12 month beforehand. It's all organised through licence. Uh, health and safety, where equipment has to be tested, which is a current test certificate, which is done by an independent engineer. Health and safety has a code which he has to adhere to. The equipment has to be done crack tested by independent engineers to make it safe for insurances. Uh, all major rides, excess of a million pound coverage for liability, which is all costly. And for your 50 pence ride on a roundabout, well, it's not too bad. We get slanged there quite a bit for uh, maybe one or two accidents that happened on a fair gun. We can't always be 100% safe on a fairground. You're on thrill rides. If you've gone on a thrill ride, you have to expect a bit of a risk. The showman does everything humanly possible to make that ride safe. Our biggest problem is the joy riders. They're half drunk, not really particular fussy what they're doing. They tend to jump off before the ride finishes. And most actors are then colliding, or accidents are colliding with other people panting on the ride. And this is something we get blamed for, and it's hard to do. Uh, in general, we travel about, where kids go to school, everywhere. My name's Sabrina Dawson, and this is my little cousin Ford. Uh, I'm 11 year years old, and he's only about a few days. All of school children of my age go to the same school, like, all our lives. And I, I, go, to the, I go to different schools. You find it hard, chopping and changing schools. Well, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's, it's easy. It's not, not quite bad. Sometimes it's really fun. How do the other children treat you? Well, so, some of them, they tease me and some of them, they quite like me. 
most of the people, like when I met new schools, they like me, but my old school, there's quite a lot of people che tease me when I met my old school. What do they say? Well, they call me like things like Gypsy and Tinker, things like that. It's, I, I don't think that's right, because I'm far from that. There's nothing wrong with a life. You can live quite comfortable and be prepared to work hard. You have to be a lot more honest than people give us credit for, because all worst sites depend on license. And if you're a bad character, a bad reference, or any of that, you cannot get a license. And, you know, this worries us a lot. Our society is one of the few societies, I would say, that we can be fined heavily, thousand pound or more, for being drunk and disorderly. We have to toe the line and keep up a good front. Not many people that accept us as this. It's a, like I say, they still think, as I said before, we're third-rate citizens. Hello, my name is George Evan. Travel and Sherman. And as you can see, Sherman's work's never done. This is my workshop. Most Sherman, as you know, are on the road nine months of the year. So this is mobile. It's a lorry. It's constructed inside the generator's workshop, etc. Um, generally, it's so that we can do our maintenance, repairs, rebuilding equipment, etc. while we're on the road. The on the bench here, we have grinding tools and full main switchboard, which is means that from external power supply, also the generating supply. Up here we've got um, switch gear for the generator. Uh, we've got a vice, double level on the on the bench here, a bit lower here, but easier on the back. Uh, under here we have a transformer which reduces the voltage for one of our rides. As the generator produces one voltage, this separates it into two separate voltages. Uh, over here, we have the control console for the generator, uh, i.e. voltmeter, amp meter, start, stop, automatic ignition, uh, fuse box, switch, on off, lift up under here, charging system for the generator. Over here, big heavy drill, 5-8 chuck, mesh taper, one of the hole, precisely in its place. Best tool for the job. Down here, I'll start with drills. As I say, this has all got to travel with us for nine months of the year. Can't leave my mind. As we get further down the workshop, we're now facing the other way. We have pressure washing here for generally keeping the place clean and tidy. Some stuff here for wiping the hands, which doesn't do a lot of good. We're generating here. This is the main generator for the vehicle. Also, use it, we use it for the outside equipment. This generally supplies me with the power for welding, cutting, grinding, uh, all the bag of tricks. Up here on the wall, we have the main switchboard that we use when we go on the town mains, when we want the mains power for, from the electricity board. We look in here in the summertime, we go there for three months to burn power, and um, we get a local supply of power, which saves us from having to do all the work. As we go along here, we've got diesel pumps and um, gears here for blowing the tyres up off the lorry. We use the air system on the lorry to blow the tyres up, etc. At the back here, and all the way along the bottom of the generator here, I think you can just see a little bit of it, with all the gear for a hydraulic winch, which is underneath the back of the vehicle, which we're using soft. And then really where we do it, it's a bit greasy. The IE parks, etc., where we don't want a child to end up, we use a winch. This might look a bit elaborate to you, but for me, I really require all this. This helps me, when I'm on the road for nine months, to generally keep everything ticking over without having to go here, there and everywhere. So that's generally what the workshop's for. You can't go far in the fairground without hearing the whine of generators. And even some of these power units have an interesting background. Here's Colin Sedgwick again. Well, you see, this is a this generator generates the power for all rights, which has got to be 110 DC current. Now, this one originally was out of a German submarine, 
The dynamo itself was out of the submarine, but where we fitted the Gardner engine on, it was a Dutch German Dutch engine that was originally on it. And it's a 500 amp power unit. And that drives uh, the big ride that I have. It's not very many people has that type of dynamo now because there's very far and few between. It just happened we happened to buy it many years ago of a scrapyard. And it's been a very good set for us. Bright lights are one thing. Carl Pinder is a showman and an artist who's decorated many rides. Well, showman and fairground art are completely different to other art forms in general. We tend to find that on a fairground you decorate rides and equipment to correspond with whatever is currently the thing on TV or in press whichever has a, a big impact on the public. You tend to find if you walk down the fairgrounds that the logos on the front reflect very, this very much. For instance, a friend of mine has a, a ride which I built a decorated from some years back, a, which I decorated twice, both with the same theme, followed the Outer Limits program that was on TV. Um, like my ghost train has a Dungeons of Doom theme because just calling it a dun uh, ghost train and decorating it as a ghost train, well that's all hack. So you try and give it a, an appeal that, that is, although it's not the Temple of Doom, the Dungeons of Doom rings true at the back of people's mind, you see. There used to be a great deal more of pictorial work on the rides. And now uh, you seem to walk around the fair and you find a great deal of repeated patterns and there's not a great deal of originality anymore, you know, unfortunately. Crowded into this small space are about 200 families. But how do the neighbours react to having a small village suddenly spring up behind the walls of their back garden? I've lived here for about 30 odd years and they uh, have no difficulty at all or any problems with the people coming to the tribes, the show people. The only thing is it's litter from the people that come into the tribes, not the show people. How about you sir? Had any problems with the tribes? No problems, no sometimes. Sometimes in fact it's usually the same people that come to the back of the garden and they're all very friendly and very courteous. Have you ever lost anything at all? Has anything ever gone missing at all? No, not to my knowledge. No, we haven't had anything no. stolen. Yeah. Would you describe them as being honest people? Or? Yes, they're very fair dealing people. I think it's the people that come to the trace that are more of a hooligan element, if there is any. What about your car? Your gardens well, leads onto the trace, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I have to leave my car in the, on the roadway. That's the only little inconvenience, but well, I'm sort of used to that. I just accept it. But Stenhouse Muir Football Club say there have been occasions when manhole covers, sewage pipes and paving slabs on their ground at the Trist have been damaged, probably unintentionally, by the showman's heavy vehicles. The club has also suffered break-ins at the time of the Trist, but they blame troublemakers who are attracted to the fair rather than the showman. It's almost the end of the fair, and after two weeks, the first of the showmen has decided it's time to be on the road again. The Whites have pulled down their Easy Rider and are heading out towards one of the Glasgow fairs. The Trice still has another night to run, and some of the showmen are content to stay on. But over the next few days, most of them will move on, and their trails will crisscross Scotland. When we're getting ready to move, when my husband's outside packing away all the equipment, I have to, in general, clean in here and then put away the ornaments. We have to take down everything, pack it away. The sides in this do come in, so everything, the carpet has to be rolled, and the sides have to be pushed in, ready for on the road and coupled up. Well, I suppose it's work, but I don't think it's really hard, because we're used to doing it, we've always done it. 
a life living in a caravan is just like living in a house, so it moves. Next morning, the tryst is officially over. The showman worked into the wee small hours pulling down the big rides, and now there's just odds and ends to be packed away. It's mid-morning, and after a few hours sleep, the pace is picked up, as nearly everyone seems to be in a rush to get on the road. All hands are needed to hitch up the trailers. Yes, she's secure, and another wagon is rolling. Caravans are manhandled into position, ready to be coupled up, and more empty spaces appear in the fairground. One last check, nothing's been left behind, and the back doors are closed. Time for everyone to get on board. And the kiddies get the best seat beside Dad in the cab. All set? and we're ready to roll. But oops, he's left his trailer door open. Carl Pinder Jr. takes charge of the ghost train. And muscle power is the order of the day. Time to take in the washing. And there's still some work to be done. But now the heavy vehicles are flooding out of the trist. That's Thomas Irvin, who operates side stalls and juvenile attractions pulling out. And here's John Walter Cordona's Leyland Octopus, dating from the late 1950s, which is converted into a living wagon. Down at the main entrance, Thomas Irvin has to negotiate the tight right-hand corner onto the main road. No trouble, and he's away. The Nielsen family are also on the move. Next comes George Irvin, making an impressive sight. Nielsen's 1949 Fordham, loaded with juvenile attractions and side stalls. This was one of the oldest vehicles in the Scottish fairground scene and is now in preservation. Some of the showmen decorate their vehicles, and since this video was taken, George Irvin has also nicely mounted his transport. In the rear of the lorry is George's mobile workshop, which he uses to maintain his juvenile ride and other attractions. The lorry is pulling George's smart living wagon. And it's a tight turn. Just listen to the tires rubbing against the curb. Considering the long association with Falkirk District, very little of the Trists now remains at Denny, Grove Lone, Stenhouse Muir, Trist Road, and at Falkirk, the two tanneries, one has now disappeared to make way for the new road system, and the other, now a carpet warehouse, is shortly to disappear. The original barn which the tanners used to feed their works has been coveted and no longer exists. A week later, one of the last vehicles pulls out of the trist, and now the ground is almost deserted. It'll be a year until they all come together again at next year's trist.